what he didn't say was that we're, we are old friends, so that this is the most difficult kind of uh, conversation where you are suddenly in, a, in an auditorium talking in, mic to a, mic in a microphone to a, a friend being overheard by several st strangers. And so we are pretending that we have never met before. Welcome, Mr. Rodriguez. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. You're very welcome. Um, since this evening is part of a California Stories Uncovered campaign, which is encouraging Californians to really consider the significance of their own stories, as well as those of fellow Californians, I want to begin by asking you a little bit about how you came to write your stories. When and, and why did you begin writing Hunger of Memory? I began writing Hunger of Memory. Uh, I should tell you that I, I began writing, uh, even though my, my, particularly my mother did not want me to write about my life. Um, she wrote, she wrote me a letter, actually, in which she asked me to keep family matters private. If you grow up in certain ethnic communities, you know, you know that voice, the mother or the father who says, you know, what happens in the family happens in the family. And uh, I was being taught in school to form this other voice, the voice to speak to strangers, the voice that, that, that belonged to the city. And I, I remember reading uh, Maxine Hong Kingston's first book, um, Woman Warrior, uh, which I will steal from. Uh, at the, uh, the first sentence of the letter, uh, the first sentence of the book, uh, Maxine is quote, quoting her mother, and her mother is saying, what I'm, what I'm about to tell you, you must never repeat to anyone else. <laughs> and, I, and I saw that and saw, well, this is what a writer does, that the writer's business is betrayal. And I think, I think that, uh, that, that my impulse to tell stories was, come, it came, most fundamentally from a kind of privacy, a long childhood of, 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 of living with books, of having no one to talk to about those books, of, uh, of, of watching from a distance this incredible Mexican family of mine begin to splinter as middle class success began to invade the family, um, and having this prohibition put on me by my, by my parents not to write about my life, in some way encouraged me to do exactly that. I, I, don't, I don't mean it to be a bratty thing, but it, it, was, it was that I could only say these things to a stranger. I could only say these things to you. And so in some way, it was that process of trying to find my public reader that caused me to want to write. Mm -hmm. I think readers sometimes assume that books are written in exactly the order in which we read them. You know, the writer begins on page one and goes all the way through. And of course, that's not only, not usually the case, it's almost never the case, though it may be in, in, in your case, which is what, what I'm going to ask. Do you remember the actual starting point of hunger of memory that, that is the particular story that sort of compelled itself out of you? No. I do. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the truth. I, in fact, I. I didn't, the, the, the struggle with Hunger of Memory, my first book, was trying to find a voice. How do you sound? How shall I come to the front of this auditorium and sound my voice? With what kind of tone do I speak to you? Um, with, what, with what sadness will you allow me to speak? You know, the, the, the thing about friends is that they normally think that they know what you sound like. And when you begin to sound a different way, they're the first ones who will tell you, you know, what, get off of it. You know, what, what is this that you're doing? So you have to find a, a voice that, that, that an audience will accept as yours. And that really was the hardest part of, of Hunger of Memory. And the other part of Hunger of Memory that was difficult was, how do I write about this boy, his, his insecurities, uh, his, his difficulties, his, um, his brattiness, without either making him too hateful, or on the one hand, or on the other hand, trying to justify him too much. Wh who, who is the I that was describing the, the he? And that distance between the adult and the, and the boy was crucial and difficult. The second chapter of the book got rewritten maybe 30, 40 times because I couldn't find the, ro the right way to make fun of the boy uh, without, without either and balancing your sympathy to, too much toward him, or, or in, in some sense, distinct, 
distancing myself as, as, as the man from who he was. You uh, didn't want to be too much the bully to the subject that's right. that you were. That's right. And I had to acknowledge that I was he, mm -hmm. and that, that, that I was, I'm, I'm merely another version of that boy. It's interesting because your writing addresses public issues in a very personal way. It's That's the only way I can write. Mm -hmm. I can't. I don't believe in writing a, uh, just about my my personal life, a, my a memoir. I I believe in writing about affirmative action or about AIDS, or about NAFTA, or about um, the Vatican Council. Since I'm thinking a lot about the Pope today, uh, I think about those issues, um, and then I want to intrude the personal life into these big public issues of our time. Can you collide the, the they, the headline, the, the, the abstract story with the, with the, with the pulsing heart? Can you, can you, can you make those, those two lines collide in an interesting way, the individual story and the, 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 public, the public event? Um, so I, the first chapter is about affirmative, it's about bilingual education. That's what it's about. But it is really also about my experience of speaking Spanish and then losing Spanish and then having my grandmother speak to me uh, until her death and, and that, it, that experience of, of not being able to translate. A friend would come over to play with me and she would stick her head out the window. And what she would say to me is something like, um, in Spanish, why are you playing in the dirt? But what her voice was saying is, why are you playing with him? Why are you playing with a stranger? Why are you playing with this, this gringo kid? Get inside, and because you belong to me. And so he, my best friend, Tommy, would ask, what did she say? And there was no way of saying it, because literally all she said was, don't play in the dirt. But what I heard her say, what I heard her voice sound, was not a word, but the words were saying beyond themselves, come back to us. And uh, so the chapter becomes complicated. It's, it's no longer simply about bilingual education as a political issue, but my intersection with that political issue. Did you, did you begin with the issue, or did you begin with? I began with the issue. I, I wrote this book largely just after no, our friendship when I was struggling with the issue of affirmative action, of being a minority student. Um, we were both at Berkeley together and, and suddenly opportunities were coming to me because of affirmative action. And I had to start thinking about that term, minority student. What does that term mean? Who is a minority? How do you decide that? Can you write about those issues in a poetic way? Do writers have something to say to the world? Or are we now in an age of journalism where we merely report what politicians say? Do we have some stake in these conversations? That's what Hunger of Memory tried to do. And insofar as it's, it's, if it succeeds, it, it has taken some of those issues away from politicians. It's interesting seeing the way others define your work, because there's always some intimate work, you know, autobiographical essay personal essay, meditation. Yes. These are all kind of private things, isn't yes. it? But yet you're talking about public issues. They're public essays too, yes. Well, I think most of us think of writing as a very solitary occupation. But I've heard some writers say that when they sit down to write, the room fills up very quickly with other voices, other people. How, how is it? No, you? not for me. Not the UPS man, maybe, but that's about <laughs> it. Uh, there's nobody in my room when I write. I, um, I, what, what's mysterious for me is coming to a room like this and looking at you and someone will come up and say, oh, I'd like, I'd like your work very much, and I don't believe them. Uh, I, don't, I don't believe that they actually read anything that I've said, writ written, and, and, then they'll re and then somebody, a woman will remember a line. She says, oh, I love that line. Or a young man said, I keep repeating to myself this line you wrote in the book, which I don't even remember. Um, and then I think to myself, oh, they are my reader. This is the person I was in correspondence with 20 years ago, and it takes me this long to find them, uh, or this long for them to find me. It's an extraordinary moment, very subtle and very quiet, and you sign the book, and you don't, maybe you notice, or maybe you don't notice my hand is trembling, because I have finally found you. I found the person I've been trying to address, 
And what I have not told you until now is that you allowed that voice to sound. You allowed me to speak in a way that I could not speak to my friends. Um, there's a paradox which I deal with at the end of Hunger and Memory, and that is there are some things so personal you can only f say them to a stranger. Um, and uh, young, w young girls, for some reason girls know this more easily than boys do, but when they address, when they get a little diary and they address those private thoughts to dear diary, precisely because they can't say these things to their sisters or their mother or to their brothers, God knows, um, it, and then they lock that, that little booklet. Those, those, that moment when you realize that there is a, there's a voice within you that has to sound beyond your family uh, is really a very powerful thing. But in many ways, I have been looking for you for a long time, and you've been sitting in the library here. Um, I should have come by one of, the, one of these nights and found you all sitting here. Here, here you are. Because uh, part of what the campaign is trying to do is encourage people to come forward with their story, I've been finding people are very curious about how writers get by the blank page or the blank computer screen. Do you have any um, rituals or times of day or incense that you use or anything that, that sort of <laughs> gets, because it can be quite intimidating, that what we used to call the blank page. Hemingway used to sharpen 24 pencils, and, I mean, as a <laughs> No, I don't, I don't write every day anymore. I, I write when I'm compelled to write. Um, I'm thinking about religion a great deal right now. And I don't know when I'll start writing that book or when it will start writing me. Um, in the meantime, I do a lot of journalism, uh, usually under deadline, pressure, and so forth. I was supposed to do a piece on uh, Cardinal Ratzinger yesterday, but I, I hadn't really thought about it yet. I hadn't thought about him enough to be able to write about him. I'm very much interested in, in the, the um, struggle of the desert religions, what I call the desert religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam that come out of the desert, and how the desert landscape informs the theology, the, the landscape of extreme cold nights, hot days, the desert uh, of, of mirage, the desert of scarce water, the desert of extreme loneliness in that vast sky, how it informs those three religions. But I haven't written a single word yet. I'm waiting for it to happen. And what you say, that it comes every 10 years, it doesn't come to me as, as inspiration. It comes to me as this moment, this morning I will come and I will say, I have thought about this enough. It's time for me to start writing. And I, I trust that that will happen. There's a, <clears throat> there's a cartoon, I think, of, that was in The New Yorker that, um, that shows a man standing, uh, I think it's supposed to be Thurber actually, standing in the middle of a party. And he just has a kind of a blank stare. And his wife is explaining, don't mind him, he's writing. <laughs> <laughs> well, can I tell you that when, I, when I, I, I do a lot of journalism, I interview people all the time and I'm listening to people all the time. And people tell me stories all the time. They did it just out here. Somebody was telling me a story about coming across um, the Rockies in, in this old car that almost didn't make it across with her son. And I'm beginning to, s I think to myself, can I steal the story? Can I make it mine? Um, there's, there's so much that people give you on airplanes. Um, this man was sitting next to me on an on a American Airlines. And um, he wanted to talk, and I didn't want to talk. And so I kept the newspaper <laughs> around me like this. And then they, they brought the chicken by, and so I had to put the newspaper down. And as soon as I put the newspaper down, he pounced. Um, and then he started talking to me. He said, where are you headed? And I said, uh, Kennedy Airport. I presume we're both going to the same place. <laughs> and then he, st he told me this extraordinary story. As, as the plane w went into darkness and we crossed Kansas and Illinois, it was a story about his, uh, the death of his son. His son had died in a boating accident the previous summer, or maybe two summers ago. And it was one of these stories so raw that you, you feel maybe he shouldn't be telling me this. And then he says to me, you know, my wife and I, we have grieved of, over the loss of our son, but we have still not talked about this to each other. And I think to myself, this guy is telling me this story that he has not told his wife. And that's when I began, that's when I, that's when I steal it. 
That's when I steal. That's somebody, somebody gave that to me, that notion that there are things so personal you can only say them to a stranger. Um, and that's what I keep looking f to, you, to you to tell me. I grew up in California in the 1950s in Sacramento in a neighborhood surrounded by people who'd come from the Midwest. Um, and they had come from Indiana and Iowa and um, Nebraska. I wondered sometimes whether anybody was left back there because there were so many. <laughs> but they were always, they would, talk, they would talk about winters in Nebraska and how the woman said to me, you will never know what cold is, she said to me in California. It was, it, was, it was in some way as though I, w I grew up in the Midwest so that years later when I finally went to these places, I recognized them immediately because they had, been, they had formed the, 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 the narrative of my childhood, the, 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 the tone of voice, the, the, the ironies of the Midwest, the, uh, the humor. Uh, this is the, it, it, it was something I grew up with, I was surrounded by. Um, I, didn't, I wasn't surrounded by Mexico, I wasn't surrounded by by anything except the stories of other people. And then my Mexican aunt marries my uncle from India, and suddenly there are these stories of India. And, and, um, and then the, the women who shoved the English language down my throat are all from Ireland. And there are these extraordinary stories of Ireland and poverty in Ireland and faith in Ireland, devotion to the Virgin Mary in Ireland. And the child begins to explore the universe with these stories. So when I see these, these students winning these, these stories, I, wanna, I want to get the letter. <laughs> I want to get the letter because that's how, I, that's how I form my California too. I've been surrounded by stories. The, the embarrassment for, for me as a native Californian is that you, you, you learn very early that the most interesting Californians all came here from somewhere else. From the very beginning, Junipero Serra, the father of California, comes here from Mallorca from Spain. And then come the pioneers from, from wherever they come from, the gold rush, every corner of the world. There are very few famous Californians who are native to this state. Marilyn Monroe is one of the few. Um, <laughs> and, I, and Walt Disney, you know, Walt Disney, my childhood, he came here from Illinois. He created um, Mickey Mouse on, on a train coming west. Um, and he created Minnie Mouse in Burbank. And I've always thought Minnie was much less interesting than Mickey because Mickey was from the Midwest. Minnie was from here. Um, everybody who was from here was sort of, it was like, you know, little Ricky, uh, Lucille Ball and Desi Arnaz. Desi was from Cuba and, and, and Lucy was from somewhere, Illinois or some Indiana. And then they have little Ricky in Hollywood. And little Ricky, who knows what happens to him in the world, but. Lucy and Desi, they're the point of California. The, the, these people who come with their dream to create a, a new reality. I've always been impressed by how, many, how, ma how much of California is imported. Comes here from China, comes here from India, comes here from Ireland, comes here from New Jersey. And it's, it, it all gets built building next to building next to building. And those of us who are native, we just wander, we wander through. In, in uh, Disneyland, there's a, there's a rule that if you work in one of the five theme parks, Main Street, Tomorrowland, Frontierland, there are, there are um, passageways underneath these areas so that if you're dressed up as a cowboy, you don't go to, to the, at the end of the day, you don't go to the parking lot through uh, Cinderella's palace. You go underneath so that the tourists will never see people from different areas of the park crossing paths. You never see Daniel Boone walking down the street with, with Cinderella. <laughs> Except in, in California, that's what you saw all the time. You saw people of completely opposite geographies, completely opposite mythologies, walking side by side. This is what California meant. It was this disjunction that was so thrilling to this place and so weird, so mysterious. This seems like the uh, best moment to ask you to read this passage <laughs> because I think you, you practically were, were saying it. This is from 
uh, Where the Poppies Grow, which was an essay you did. I apologize for this essay. This is a difficult essay. And it, like a lot of my most recent essays, it has about five or six different parts. In the last part of the essay, I'm impersonating uh, an elderly woman from Santa Monica who is in despair at how much California is changing. And she finds in this museum this Vietnamese girl looking at this picture of California, this famous painting of California. And it's that layered, she sees the painter looking at California and the Vietnamese girl looking at the, at the painter's vision of California. And then she is watching the Vietnamese girl watching the painter's vision of California. This is from the beginning of the essay. All my life I have lived within the irony created by the many Californians. Though finally there are only two, I mean those who came here from elsewhere and the native born. The Californian natives, a laid back tribe, watched the approach in the distance of Junipero Serra, the father of California, paternity thus stalking them with a limping gait. Junipero Serra had a very bad leg by the time he came to California, so he limped all the time. I am so thoroughly Californian as to imagine the genesis cinematically, the camera shuttling back and forth between distance and foreground, rather between foreground and foreground, two cameras, that's the point. Obliterating distance, bisecting narrative, eventually making one of twain. My own domestic comedy reflected that first splice. My parents from Mexico, their children born at the, Calif born at the destination, born here in California. My parents' ambition was California. Mine was to seek the greater world to get out of California. I didn't get far. I live today in a Victorian, San Francisco Victorian, subdivided by memory. Upstairs, Arizona lives. Across the hall, Tennessee, who, who often will appear without any clothes. <laughs> I don't know, I don't exactly understand nudists, but he often will not wear clothes. And I have often brought people to my apartment and he will be vacuuming the hallway without any clothes, Tennessee. Downstairs lives Alabama, the sweetest landlord in the world, Alabama. My neighbors all seem at home in this city. It is theirs. I am the uneasy tenant, for I was born at St. Joseph's Hospital less than a mile from where I write these words. St. Joseph's Hospital no longer exists. It's over by the Castro. It's been turned into condos. A common early theme of America was the theme of leaving home, almost an imperative for writers and other misfits. The subordinate theme was the impossibility of return. You can't go home again. I always read that theme primarily as East Coastal or Midwestern. I construed from it the gravity of tall cities rather than the constriction of towns. There is a new, newer American refrain, a Western refrain. What happens when home leaves you? A few years ago, the BBC came to California and they wanted to do a documentary on my life. And they wanted to go to Sacramento to see where I was, where I was raised, my house on 39th Street. And we got to the location and we found out that the house no longer exists. It's, it's, it, uh, was, it is now a parking lot, typical California narrative. And I was telling an audience of this in Sacramento some years later, and the woman raised her hand. She said, do you want to see your house? She said, I said, no, you don't understand. My house no longer exists. I was with the BBC crew and we could not find my house. It's now a parking lot. There are doctor's office, there are doctor's Mercedes parked where my bedroom used to be. She said it's over on N Street. They've moved it. <laughs> California's nativist chagrin is older and louder because California has for so long played America's America, the end of the road, or a second shot of the future. California has served also as Asia's primary port of, port of entry, now too the busiest border crossing from Latin America. California's native-born children, whatever our color or tongue, realize very early that California takes every impression. Our parents, on the other hand, are very surprised by how many Californians, how many Californias they find when they get here. Nothing at all like they expected. Nothing like the movie. 
my early intuition as a native son was that California was dreamed into being elsewhere. I noticed the paradigmatic Californians were not so by birth. Richard, Richard Diebenkorn came from Oak, Oregon. Cesar Chavez was born in Yuma. Willie Mays, Louis B. Mayer, Jack Kerouac, Richard Neutra, Lucy and Desi, Edward Teller, all of them from far away. All of them living forever in California on the same street. Mickey Mouse was conceived aboard the Santa Fe westward bound. Minnie was born from his rib, born here, as was John Steinbeck, born in Salinas. His house still stands. Steinbeck's generosity, his generosity was to invent the Jode family's first view of orange groves, to believe that the or Oklahoma Jodes were more important to the myth of California than their native-born grandchildren who live in suburban Bakersfield and who now complain about all the changes. <laughs> but that is remarkable about Steinbeck. I mean, that, that California's greatest writer, native-born writer, his greatest book was about people who came to the state from elsewhere. His generosity as a writer is that he could imagine, he could imagine the story in reverse. He could imagine himself seen from outside, the writer's talent, to imagine the story in reverse. The states, in fact, that this is something I tend to do in rooms. Um, how many of you were born in California? Wow. Not, not half, though, no. right, would you say? No. All right. right. At this moment, I think, um, uh, I used to be able to say that there hadn't been a time since 1850 where more than half of the people living in California were born here. It's currently 50.2 percent. In whose favor? Uh, in in native-born. Native-born. Just happened about three years ago. Well, that's why you get Proposition 13. I mean, uh, you know, when the native-born get on the rampage and we start complaining about all of you coming this way, we elect Ronald Reagan for our governor of optimism. <laughs> <laughs> Can I just say about that, Ronald Reagan, I mean, I know that he's dead and everything, but um, the New York Times called when he died and, and asked me what I thought of him, the optimism he gave to this country, and I thought, I don't remember any optimism coming with Ronald Reagan. I remember it with Pat Brown, the, the real Governor Brown, the first Governor Brown, um, who created the University of California system. Pardon me? <laughs> the, the University of California system. I'll get back to lower taxes in a moment, yes. Um, the University of California system made the water run up the side of a mountain, created the freeway system to California. That California was my California, the California that was building, that believed in the future. Um, and then suddenly the native born start taking over the state. We have had enough of Iowa, we've had enough of India, we've had enough of China, we've had enough of Mexico. We want the, the, loan, the, the people who, 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 who own the land, who own the real estate, no longer want to pay taxes for those bratty kids at Berkeley, who no longer want uh, the, the freeway system which, which now brings more people into the state. And they begin to tighten California. I, don't, I think that there really are two different themes or two different motifs in this state. On the one hand, there is still this buoyancy, which I detect now in the immigrant communities in the state, this optimism about California, particularly because it, they're coming to, to America in many cases, I think of the Asians, who are coming to California exactly in reverse. Whereas California was seen mythically as the end of the road, now they are seeing California as the beginning of the road and they're bringing a, a, a completely new sense of the geography of the country to us. Um, but, the, but they're competing against this other energy in the state which is, has had enough. We had too many people, we don't want any more, the traffic is too bad, we're stuck on the Santa Monica Freeway, it's taking us two hours to get home and so forth and so on. Um, these two energies are at play in California. Um, as a native born, I suppose I'm the one complaining on the freeway, but as, as someone who dreams, I think of the people who come to the state from Illinois and from uh, India, and I think they completely replenish my life every day 
with their bravery. This is a question I've been asking of other authors in the uh, anthology. What part of the immigrant's story do you think is most invisible to the, the pain, board? The pain. I, I think it takes so much pain. To, it, say, it takes so much difficulty to leave home. Um, and then to, to establish one's life in a place as difficult as California, by which I mean it's confusing, by which I mean it's tumultuous, by which I mean it's rude, by which I mean it's as buoyant and, and brilliant and vulgar and noisy. And then to sacrifice your children to this culture, to lose your children to California. I know a lot of parents, Mexican parents, who tell me, you know, I, I came here because I wanted to get a better job and I wanted something for my children, but I did not want American children. Mm -hmm. um, and I say, well, it's a little too late, you know. <laughs> it's a little late. Um, and I, you know, you, you, you hear these stories from kids in the city, their pain of living between two pronouns. You know, we live at home in these immigrant homes where we have these plural pronouns, the we. We are family, we are Chinese, we are Mexican. We belong together. And then you send your children to Galileo High School or, or Lowell, and they are taught to be I people there. And the child has to learn a kind of bilingualism. How do you, how do you come back to the house when your teacher has taught you to be I, and suddenly there is this necessity to be we in the house? This boy I know in San Francisco, who, who's now, I don't think he's here, I can tell his story. He, um, he complains to me that, you know, that his, uh, his teacher in, in his high school here in town is, is always trying to create Huck Finn in him. We want American kids to be like Huck Finn. We want them to leave home. We raise children to leave home in America. We would want them to be independent. We want them to skateboard past the, 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 the landscape. We want them to be cowboys in America. So the kid is always being criticized by his teacher for not speaking up. We can't hear what you're saying, Michael. Get your hands out of your pockets, Michael. Speak up with a loud voice so we can all hear what you're saying. So all the boys and girls can hear what you're saying. And don't look at the ground when you're speaking. He goes home. His Chinese father is complaining tonight about how much, how much the gringo he's becoming. Uh, that he's, he's learning this slouch. Where'd you get that slouch from, M your MTV? and take that gum out of your mouth. And then the Chinese father says to him, Michael says, and since when have you started looking your Chinese father in the eye? You know, there is so, I, I think sometimes in America, we are so oblivious as to what this drama is, even though it is one of the great stories of our country, as great a story as emancipation or, or the, 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 the freedom of, of, of the poor to, uh, to become middle class in this country. The story of the dislocated migrant um, immigrants and how they have to face this drama of recreating themselves as I people is, is an extraordinary story. That pain is very rarely described. It's a secret. Maybe on Oprah, but that's about it. <laughs> you know, I wrote Hunger Remember. This is not an ad, but uh, that book is about pain. It is about be the pain of becoming middle class. And it's, I still get letters from kids. I get a lot of, I get an email from kids on trim paper nights, uh, <laughs> which is another story altogether. They usually send me an email. I don't know how they found my email address, but they'll, they'll send it to Dear Dick. They'll say, you know, our teacher has assigned your book, and uh, it's a very good book, they say. Uh, this is a question that our teacher has asked. What do you think, they'll say. <laughs> but every once in a while, you get this email from this kid who is bleeding. And it is a he or a she. Sometimes they're in high school, sometimes they're older. Get lots of letters from Chinese kids. I would guess that if I have a, my largest ethnic group that I get, it's Chinese kids, especially girls. I think in some other life I was a Chinese girl because um, I know something about them and they know something about me. And, and, and it, nobody talks about it, that pain. Americans are not good on pain. Um, Somebody, uh, Anthony Lewis, Anthony Lane, Lake, what's his name, the movie reviewer in the New, New Yorker, Lane, yeah. He was talking about some hideous cartoon movie recently. He said it's all about, uh, he said it like the, all of these movies you were seeing these days. It's all about destruction, but there's nothing about pain. 
Um, nobody knows how to talk about pain in America. Um, take a leave. Take a pill. Um, change the subject. You know, or get some therapy. I have uh, two questions I'd like to end on in talking about California. Um, one is a quotation from uh, Joan Didion's mm. recent Where I Was From. Which I did not like. <coughs> Can oh, I say that? Oh, good, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, where she no, I thought, you know, that Joan Didion was such a, she was, she was the first great writer of my childhood who, who writing in Sacramento when I w was reading her in places like Holiday Magazine, I didn't know you could write about California and that the East Coast would pay attention in, in that way. And there was Joan Didion. And those California essays that she wrote from the 50s to the early 70s were the most remarkable essays. I still think that I, you know, I go to these Santa Monica dinner parties and I always get, get seated next to a Joan Didion heroine, one of the heroines from a, one of the novels. And she comes in with a Chanel dress and she hasn't eaten for a long time. And <laughs> she's very nervous and, and she's, um, she doesn't have very much to say, and, and she's like this. And I yearn for, to sit next to Joan Didion, the essayist, who is, who is smart and, and, and funny and ironical. Uh, but I always get next to the Joan, Dara, Joan Didion heroine. But go ahead, I was interrupting. Well, uh, as, as someone who's actually thought about California, I thought, she said, California has remained in some way impenetrable to me, a wearying enigma as it has to many of us who are from there. We worry it, correct and revise it, try and fail to define our relationship to it and its relationship to the rest of the country. Do you find California a wearying enigma? No, I don't. Th I find it a constantly a challenging place. Um, it would be easier to live in New Jersey. Um, but I, I, I find California very expensive, um, a, a very cruel place many times, um, but I don't find it, I don't find it enigmatic in that way, no, I don't. Mm -hmm. Well, I, the statement I wanted to end with is one I think you've heard before. It's an um, uh, adaptation of a quotation that Samuel Huntington made about America, and it's this. Critics say that California is a lie because its reality far, falls so far short of its ideals. But they're wrong. California is not a lie. California is a disappointment. But it can only be a disappointment because it is also a hope. Hmm. Does that resonate? Yes, it does. Um, no, of course it's a, every dream is a lie. I mean, every dream is, is almost of its very nature, unable to be realized in daylight. Um, but it, it, the, 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 the drive, the, the energy that comes from places like California that attract people who don't quite belong other place, in other places, who are un uneasy in the places where they, where they grew up and want this other place to reinvent themselves. Of course, it's going to, there, there will always be this, satis this, 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 this dissatisfaction that finally it didn't amount to what one wanted. I remember telling my father who, who had achieved a kind of success in California. He had, by the time, you know, in, in 30 years, he had moved from the working class to a comfortable middle class position. My mother was working then f for Governor uh, Edmund G. Pat Brown as a typist until she got fired for typing one day correctly the wrong word. She heard on the dictaphone a uh, reference to urban gorillas and she typed gorillas G-O-R in the letter and it offended uh, the sensibilities of the people in Sacramento. But um, I remember remarking to him that he had this house with five bedrooms, three televisions, two cars. Look at all you've achieved, I said, the California dream. And he repeated exactly what I said, but in this voice it said, look at all of I've, I've achieved, meaning look at the little I've achieved. And um, there is this, there is this sadness in California. I tell you, it's all over, and it's not only in the Tenderloin. It is in, um, it's in Bel Air at dinner parties late at night. Um, but it is still the most interesting place 
to be because I don't know any other place in the world that it accumulates and still attracts so many dreamers. And I don't know who would be more interesting, frankly, than Howard Hughes and Walt Disney and Lucille Ball. These people are very good to have as one's neighbors. Thank you very much, Richard Rodriguez. You're welcome. Now we, we have about 10 minutes to take questions, to take your questions. And Joan has already started running towards someone. Sir, no, no um, your hand was up, oh, I'm sorry, all the way in the back. Uh, <laughs> Pardon me? N uh, no, my brother has seen it. And it, they've repainted the house and slightly changed its details. But he assures me that it is still the same house. <laughs> Thank you. Please. Uh, can I not make a question, but make a comment? Surely. A disagreement. Uh, you're speaking maybe about, well, I'll say it another way. Coming from the other side of the Atlantic, California is the only bearable place in the United <laughs> States, maybe New York. But you really, you can be an atheist. Well, what I'll say, I've never heard anybody use the word of God and so on. I decided I have to go to the South and find out who those people are. <laughs> but that's not what I'm trying to say. Anywhere in Nebraska or anywhere else, here you can be what you are. And sure, there's anti-Semitism, there is anti-Negro, there's anti-this, anti-that. But I don't think because of hypocrisy you don't feel it. I think it's really that people just have to to live with each other, and if they don't, they just stay on the other side of the street. Yes. And I think Europeans will, will agree with you. You know, when I, when I meet kids, I, try, I lecture a lot in this country at different universities, and when I meet Californians in New Jersey or in Nebraska, I ask them what they miss most about California, and they'll say something like the Chinese food or burritos, or uh, it is, it's, it's always uh, the, the sense of otherness, which is part of their or everyday life is really a part of being Californian, that you grow up with that sense of the, the, the cosmopolitan environment. And I, I, that's as true in Modesto as it is in, in, in Santa Monica. It is, this is a remarkable place for drawing so much of the world to itself. Mm -hmm, please. Um, hi, I've been um, really honored to be part of the discussion group here in the library um, using the book. Um, and the issue of um, hypocrisy has come up a lot and the, the wealth versus the, the pain and poverty. And in addition to that hypocrisy, as I listened to our governor last night saying, close the borders in Mexico, um, I just feel this, this contradiction of that we're celebrating diversity and we're trying to celebrate all these stories through this project and yet this is what's on the news last night. And yeah, this I'm is wondering your comments and if you'll do a, an essay on that sometime. Well, this, <laughs> is also, this is also California. You know that there is there's this, uh, I remember, you're not gonna like the story because it's fr friendly to Governor, then Governor Bush, but of Texas. I remember doing a piece some years ago uh, when Pete Wilson was, was governor and um, Wilson had this, you know, we, as Californians, Mexico is still, a, a very recently, one person in three uh, people in San Diego had never been to Mexico, had never gone that extra 30 miles, you know. Um, it's not like there is a Mexico there. There's Tijuana, then there is the desert, you know. Whereas Texas has the advantage of having had a Mexico there and having a long, complicated relationship with, with Mexico. However complicated and however difficult that relationship is, Texans know that Mexico is there. So I remember at the same time that Pete Wilson was pushing 187, uh, Governor uh, Bush in Texas said, we will never have 187 in Texas. And I thought, I did a piece on why Tex-Mex, the cooking, is so much better than Calmex, uh, Taco Bell. Uh, that California really is without, uh, it's it, that, 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 that dialectic with the South. Uh, and that, and you, you still hear it, even though the Governor, uh, Governor Schwarzenegger uh, was enormously popular uh, among young Hispanic male voters. Uh, they saw in him, and in his wonderful pronunciation of California, this wonderful immigrant uh, voice, it's too bad that he said what he said. 
He apologized and retracted it today. Sure, go ahead, Joan. Uh, I was wondering if uh, you found people, you know, from other parts of the uh, country coming to California and being transformed. I'm, st I'm thinking of my um, brother-in-law. When I first met him, he was, uh, this, this was in Denver, and then they moved out to California, and then they moved to Florida. And uh, I noticed when he came to California, and he became more liberal, and <laughs> we, we, we had, seemed like we had more things to talk about, and then uh, he moved to Florida. And every time I go to visit him in Florida, he's even more reactionary. <laughs> I saw him, the last time I saw him was on election day, and uh, that was a trial <laughs> in Florida. <laughs> you know what I see a lot is, uh, I see a lot of Californians who have left California, gone to Phoenix or Vegas or Florida, looking for another California, because it got too expensive here and so forth. And many times they become sort of doomsday prophets. They go to Phoenix and because they saw Los Angeles expand into Orange County and then Orange County expand into um, Riverside County, they go to Phoenix and they see it all over again and they become sort of doomsday, sort of Old Testament prophets, you know, warning everybody that if you keep building this way along the front range in Colorado, you're going to get, uh, you know, you're going to get Bakersfield, you know. Uh, there, there, there is a there is a, a, a particular transformation of the Californian as they move elsewhere. And it's almost as though we become the opposite of what we are. Um, we become this very, very sour person elsewhere. Um, what, you, what you say, I've seen many times in places like Phoenix and um, Las Vegas. I actually just spent a year and a half in Las Vegas and I was just like what you're describing and I was saying, what are you people crazy? <laughs> that's true. But uh, I was going to say that I've always noticed uh, a tension in your writing between your uh, Latino identity and your gay identity. And I was wondering, I've noticed that I've lived in Mexico and I've seen the gay community among Latinos really grow, especially here. It's become, you know, it's almost becoming as institutionalized as, as white gay life, you know, with lots of clubs. And um, I'm just wondering how, you're, how you've reconciled those over the years. and uh, is it becoming easier for you to, because to, it seems like you're more and more out. I'm wondering, has it gotten easier for you to be both Latino and gay at the same time? Um, yes, and I mean, yes, but not, but also not. I mean, I, I came out in the 1980s when friends of mine were dying of AIDS, and um, friends still die. I mean, I had two friends just last year dying of AIDS, and um, death is very much a part of my experience of eroticism. It's the question one, one asks about beautiful bodies at Gold's Gym, uh, whether they are HIV or not. I mean, you, you, I'm surrounded by that, that, that nightmare. Um, and so in many ways, I'm a wounded man. I don't, I don't know how to say that. I know we're supposed to be, you know, everybody's supposed to be up. You're supposed to be, I'm proud of being gay. I really like being gay. I, I just think it's terrific being Mexican too. And I'm really happy. I get up every morning and I'm just happy to be me. And, um, and it's, you know, life doesn't feel that way. Life feels like um, there is a stench, Will's leg, when it, was, when it was really corrupt at St. Mary's Hospital, it was so diseased that the nurses didn't want to change the bandage. He was dying, it was close to death. And, um, uh, several of us would do that, and, and, and we would change the bandage. And the, I remember the sight of his leg, and remember what that looked like at the end. I would sometimes smell that smell in the air. Sometimes I'd go in by a bakery, and I would get that scent. Sometimes it's more mysterious than that. It would just be in the, something, ex the exhaust from that car, or something like that. But then I'm gay. But then I'm very Mexican, too, because you know, I live in this golden world where being gay means, you know, having biceps and and pecs and abs and and um, and attitude and 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 suffering is not exactly part of the the agreement, you know. And um, Mexico is, has filled me with a sense of tragedy. It's it is it's just a part of my makeup, the sense of the tragic. Um, that, that 
that things come to an end, that, that things come undone. Um, so it's, I'm a, I'm a Mexican and I'm a, a gay man. But as I told Charlie Rose when he asked me if I was a gay writer, I said I'm a, I'm a ro morose writer. Um, I don't know what it is, I, don't, I cannot imagine what it is like to be a gay writer and I don't think I want to be around one of those people uh, as they write every morning. Maybe Ogden Nash was a gay writer, I have no idea. We have time for one more. You choose, Joe. <laughs> uh, as, as a native of New Jersey, I appreciate the, uh, the references. Um, <laughs> you know, and I think it's interesting because New Jersey in some ways I think is, is more like California because yes. it's got a lot of immigrant um, Absolutely. stuff going on as well. Absolutely. A lot different than when I was growing up there. And, and one thing I was just curious about is in, in a lot of ways I consider myself more a San Franciscan or maybe a Bay Area person because so much of the like the Southern California experience and all is really kind of alien mm -hmm. to the world that I live in. But how so? Freeway oriented um, and just a, a very different set of values, I think, um, and, and not just Southern California, but it's a Central Valley. You know, that's those are like the real boom areas of the state. And I feel like the Bay Area is, in some ways, the, you know, th there's more of an emphasis on environmental values and um, preserving quality of life and that type of thing. And mm -hmm. some of those same tensions th that you were talking about. Mm -hmm. But what I was wanted to ask you about is, um, as you, if you live in San Francisco and you're a family, well, you can't really live in San Francisco because it's not affordable if you're looking for a house and all. So what you have, that I think is an interesting phenomenon is that the suburbs are becoming more diverse than the city in many respects. Yeah. My girlfriend lives in Hayward and she's got Hawaiians across the street, blacks next door, the other side's they're from Zacatecas. The ice cream man has a turban and little guys push palata carts, you know, and the suburbs were way different than that when I was growing up yes. in Jersey. You didn't yes. have first generation migrant kind of people there. And to me that's just a, an interesting phenomenon and I didn't know if you had any thoughts. No, on that. I think that's exactly right. I, I just discourage you from writing off the Central Valley. I think the Central Valley is becoming very much like that, becoming very much like New Jersey. I go back to Jersey City College, City University in Jersey City to, on a regular basis because I, I'm so fond of the students there and, and it's a reciprocal relationship. But um, I know what you're talking about. Jer New Jersey has become like that. The S Sacramento has become that way too. Um, I go to Sacramento and there's this enormous Ukrainian population now in Sacramento and Laotians and, and uh, Cambodians and, and Nigerians. And it is, it's quite unlike anything I knew as a child where it was Nebraskans and the Iowans. Now the world is there. I remind you, I remind you, it was Karl Marx who predicted this. The old commie predicted this, that, that, that with the gold rush, you would have coming to California for the first time in history, people from all over the world. He said when they came to the gold fields in California, they had never come to one place before from every corner. The uh, Malaysians, Australians, Chinese, French, German, Yankees, Mexicans, Chileans, Peruvians, Africans, every corner, he said. There was all of this conflict as they came together. Everybody got locked into this traffic jam. Um, but he said from that would emerge a great civilization. He was talking about you. He was talking about us. He was talking about the work in progress. Write it. Thank you. That's a great note to end on, it seems to me. <laughs> I, just have, I just have some thank yous. I want to once again thank the San Francisco Public Library, and especially Joan Jasper and Marsha Schneider for being our host this evening. I want to encourage you to sign up for the Council's free newsletter in the back on the table. And please, I know they're pesky, but those little evaluation forms that were, uh, if you would hand them, if you'd fill them out, we actually do read them, they're vital to us, and hand them out in the back, we'd be most grateful. Uh, books are gonna be available for sale, and Richard, I think, is going to be signing some. 
And I want to, again, thank Richard Rodriguez for a wonderful conversation. Thank you.